Dirk, it's a pleasure to have you here you. in Australia. I'm, I'm just curious, you're doing these interviews, you're doing the, the speaking tour as well. When you get in a situation like this where you're just reliving all the stories and all the memories, how, how is that experience for you? You know, it's, it's fun going down memory lane every now and then. Mm. I mean, I wouldn't want to do it every day, yeah. but you know, every you know, couple of weeks and, uh, and, and seeing, you know, actually fans wanting to hear my story. And so it's been, it's been fun. And obviously all these people lining up outside, you're obviously used to this for a long time. Once you retired, is it like, okay, I would like to maybe live the, the quiet life a little bit more? I mean, I, I do pick my spots, yeah. you know, uh, I do travel a lot with my family and, uh, and it's not like I, I do this all the time. So it's actually fun. It's fun seeing that, that people still, you know, respect you for what you've done for the league or for the sport. And it, it, it means a lot. Uh, so I seen yesterday, you had the tennis racket in your hand, but I want to ask you about pickleball. So I lived in the US for a couple of years and I'd never heard about pickleball until I got over there. I see you're getting involved. I think LeBron bought into a franchise or something yeah. like that. What's going on with this pickleball craze? Yeah, it's, it's the, the fastest growing sport in the US. Uh, I think it's a sport that you can play young and old. You don't have to do a lot of running. You don't have to have a lot of skills. So it's, it's a lot easier to learn than, than tennis. So mm -hmm. I think that's why it's been, it's been taken off. And uh, yeah, it's just people love it. Uh, it's not my favorite, but uh, I do enjoy every now and then go out there and, uh, and, and dink around a little bit. And uh, it's, it's a fun little sport. Uh, so you played, and it's, the numbers are ridiculous, but 15 out of the 21 years you played 75 plus games. How is your body? That's 1,500 regular season games, playoffs most year. How are you feeling? I'm okay, actually. Uh, the ankle, uh, I struggle a little bit, of course. Uh, the left ankle, I, just, I jumped off a lot. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I'm okay. I can still, you know, get around fine. I can play some tennis every now and then. And I think my basketball days are over, though. I can never actually go back and uh, play in a game. I think, unfortunately, these days are over. Uh, but it's, it's still good enough for me to play some other sports. So do you look at, and you see the, the guys much older than you, but they're all hobbling around and they're, you, know, you guys are huge. Well, everyone's big compared to me. But do you look at the way guys are being managed now and think back to your own career and say, maybe I played through some stuff that I shouldn't have played through? Or how do you, how do you view the way guys are being managed right now? Yeah, it's just different. Times are different. You know, um, I don't want to be the guy that sit here, you know, <laughs> back in the days, everything was better or we did this thing. And it just, I was, I was, I prided myself on, on trying to be there every night, whether, whether I was sick, whether I was hurt, I wanted to be out there for my teammates and uh, for the franchise, for the fans that, you know, buy obviously the tickets and maybe wanted to come to see me play. And so, uh, you know, I started some resting as I got in my thirties and deeper thirties. Um, we did a couple, a little bit of load management, but in my twenties, I wanted, I wanted to play mm -hmm. every game as much as I could. Uh, so I was listening to, I believe it was a podcast that was a few years ago now, JJ Barea. He's talking about your pre-game routines, what you got to do the day before, what you got to do on the day of the game. And it's crazy to listen to. I lived in Milwaukee for a few years. And, and the first time I saw Giannis warming up, I, as a, not a great athlete, I'll say that, I'm watching him and I'm thinking what he's doing before the game doesn't even make sense. That would be five times what I would do on a normal day. Mm. What is JJ talking about? What are you putting yourself through before you even get on the court? I mean, I had, a, I had certain rituals and uh, I, you know, my warm up for a game was fairly long. Some guys take like, you know, 15, 20 minutes, get a little sweat and that's it and stretch a little bit. I, I legit shot right before the game for like 30, 45 minutes. <laughs> you know, I got, I had a, I had a full sweat going. I wanted to get my knees and my ankles loose, the muscles. Uh, so I, I shot a lot. I shot all my repertoire. I shot fadeaways. I shot turnaround. I shot three spot ups coming off screen. So I didn't know. I just that was my routine. I wanted to. I wanted to get a good sweat. And I wanted to be loose once uh, once the game started. So a lot of the guys are, are different. Not everything works for the same. Uh, you know, we all have different body types, and so. But for me, I wanted to be loose and uh, once the game started. And what happens if you don't get, you know, how much did you need this routine to be done? If you didn't get exactly what you need done, what does that do to you? Well, I think in my 20s, uh, what, some, if something went a little bit off my routine, I was, I was right, right, right. I didn't, this hotel didn't have pasta before the game. I was, I was worried. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, how am I going to perform without my pasta pregame? And 
uh, I think once you get a little older, you know, I think you're, you tend to relax a little more and it, it's fine. I didn't have, you know, I got treatment now pregame. Now I don't, I don't have, I didn't have, get my full 30 minutes of shooting. It's fine, you know, it's just, uh, you, you deal with things a little better as you got more experience, as you gotten older. But still, even though almost close to my retirement, uh, I still try to do the same routine all the way to the end. What about some of the, the different you know, shooting off balance we see the pirouette shot that I don't know if you were the first that that was public knowledge, but now you see KD does it before every single game. What was the theory behind all these different ways you tried to shoot and in practice make it as challenging as possible? Well, you know, I, I've always wanted to shoot every shot there that, that I had in my repertoire. So I didn't want to go in a game and all of a sudden I had to shoot, I don't know, a running hook shot, but I didn't practice it that day. So. I always pregame or even the day before the game, I always did my, my full repertoire of, of 30, 45 minutes. Like I mentioned, spot ups, common off screen, handle it some, one dribble right, one dribble left, some fadeaways, some turnarounds, some finishes in the paint. So uh, I, in my routine, I always try to shoot uh, all the shots that, um, that, that were maybe coming up in, in a game. So I shot some runners, uh, shot some one leggers. So, um, once the game started, I knew I was prepared to shoot any shot that uh, that the game would throw at me. Uh, I think I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you were talking about the one leg fade away, you said that you found that it was low energy, which to me, low energy, high efficiency, it should be the goal with every task. So mm -hmm. why was the reason that you went to that? Yeah, so I was, as I was getting older, you know, I was, I was uh, losing a step uh, and it was just a lot of grinding, driving all the time. Guys were up under me. I had to drive, get fouled, get back up, shoot two free throws. And I just wanted to, to find a shot that, uh, that, you know, I could create a little space and then I'm long enough to, to shoot over guys. And so I started shooting more as, as I turned 30, you know, um, and then that one playoff run in, in 2011, really, I shot it more and more and it, it kept going in and it was a good weapon for me. And and so then that that kind of uh, manifested it there in 2011. And then I, I kept shooting it for the rest of my career. But early on in my in my 20s, I actually didn't shoot it as much, you know, and when you're young and you, you got the drives, you got, um, I, I didn't need that, uh, but I wanted to find a way to be a, a good, efficient scorer as I got older, and that, that shot really helped me down the stretch. What do you make of the scoring binge right now in the NBA? Because the numbers are almost, if you want to compare to history, and it becomes challenging if you're trying to compare previous years, because the numbers, they just don't stack up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always tough to compare different eras, actually. Yeah, I don't love it. Is this guy better? Is this guy better? Mm -hmm. it's, it's so different now. The game is in a different place than it was 10 years ago, let alone 30 or 40 years ago. So uh, it just evolves constantly. The rules have changed along the way. And, and so uh, the game is just, uh, is just completely different. But uh, yeah, scoring now, since the court is so open, it's basically you have five guys out there they could shoot. But back in the 90s or whatever, your power forward and your center, they were always around the paint. It was always clogged. There was nowhere to go. Uh, now you have all these guys spotting the floor, spotting around. The, the drives are there. The, the driving dish guys are spotting up for threes. Uh, they all have that step back three in the game nowadays. Is that you need to have that as a weapon? All the good scorers have it. So, I mean, it's just uh, it's just that the lanes open and and guys' skill level is is just out of this world from compared to 20, 30 years ago. So you're one of the great shooters of all time. And I had this, I had a look at this this morning because I just wanted to see where it actually sits. So you average 3.4, three-point attempts per game. This season, that would be 165th in the league. Did you, which obviously is wild, did you envisage that this was the way it was going to this extreme? Well, you know, it, I saw it coming once with Steph starting to shoot the you're ball right. like that and shooting the ball from half court and, and making it. and. Uh, yeah, it was it was going that way. And then a couple of years ago, I think I was still in the league. Uh, we played uh, Houston played with Harden, and right. I think they shot what one one mid range shot. The rest were uh, all threes or layups. It was just that's where uh, the statistics were going. That's where the game was going. And it's just as long as the guys are uh, shoot dis decent percentage from three, uh, it's just way better than a two. It's just uh, it just that's that's the way the stats work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of it. Mm -hmm. I love my little mid-range. Obviously, that's where, where I did a lot of my, my work. 
Um, so I do miss it at times, but uh, I, of course, understand the game evolves, the game changes, and it's just part of it. So do you, are you, do you have any crazy ideas? So listening to Pop, and obviously most people could listen to Pop all day, but he was not happy and he's like, you want to get a four point line, a five point line, it's going to be a bunch of crap, which was like a classic Pop line. And then you have uh, JVG, I was listening to the other day and he said, get rid of the corner three. Do you subscribe to any of these crazy yeah. views? Does anything have to change? I mean, I, I love the way the game is. Mm -hmm. I always have. I don't know if we need to start changing rules and start add stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm, I'm too old school for that. <laughs> I wouldn't do a four point line yeah. as guys just start hoisting, dribbling up, shooting fours. Uh, uh, just, that's just not, not what I believe in. The corner three now is is the easiest three in the, in the game, of course. Uh, but that's why also defenses should be, you know, catered to taking that away. And a lot of defenses do. You know, if you give up a three, you give up the high three and not the ones in the corner. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. I think the game's in, in a good place, and uh, we'll see what to, what uh, what comes next. What were your experiences playing? And the FIBA court, obviously, shorter three-point line, and the NBL in here in Australia plays by those rules. And sometimes the American players will come over and they talk about how challenging it is. Did what, what did you find? Yeah, I always found it how hard to go back and forth every summer. Go back to to Europe, the lane was smaller. There's no illegal defense, so the the, the lane was always clogged. <clears throat> they were still able to chuck you, and which which that is, has gone away in the NBA. So it was always hard going going back and forth. It will take me like a few games to, to adjust, but I grew up playing FIBA ball and uh, I, I still love it. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's tough, it's tight. Um, and, and it's sometimes tough, really tough to score in Europe because, you know, the lane is, is just always clogged and, and it's physical. And, and so I, I usually enjoy playing in Europe, but then also enjoy going back to, to the NBA and have a more open field and, uh, and, and playing on the NBA rules. So I really enjoyed both. So the guys I think about, and I'm sure you'll add names to this, but yourself, Timmy, KG, Powell, I don't know if there's anyone else you want to throw in this list, but the battle you guys had for all NBA, all style, MVPs, all these types of things. How do you look back at that generation of you know, four, probably these days five, so it would have changed, but how do you look back at those battles? Yeah, it was amazing. The, uh, when I first got in the league, every power forward spot on the teams were loaded. So yeah. I had a challenge every night, you know, whether it was Abdul Rahim and, uh, you know, whether it's Rashid Wallace, I mean, it was KG, Tim Duncan, Zach Randolph later on. I mean, I felt like the, uh, the power forward spot was just uh, in, in a great KG. Malone was still in the league on, in, in Utah when I got in. So, I mean, I felt like every night I, uh, you had to bring your A game and it, of course, helped me elevate also my game because I knew I had to compete at, at the highest level every night uh, or uh, you just had no chance. So that was, was a great time for, for power forwards there. And uh, yeah, it was, it was just compete uh, every night at the highest level. So I always say out of like current players, Nikola Jokic maybe makes me just crack up laughing more than any other player with some of the stuff he does. And I feel like maybe not to, to that extreme, but Tim was kind of the same, just with his ability to use the glass and all these uh, different ways he was able to score. What, what was he like trying to defend that man? Yeah, I mean, he to me, on a matchup on a four, he was the toughest to guard. He, mm. uh, he had both shoulders uh, finishes. He was super long. He was a great offensive rebounder. Uh, he didn't miss up close. Uh, he had his little face up. He could go both ways. I mean, he was long enough to finish at the rim. So he was a matchup nightmare. And, you know, I remember we always tried to come up with schemes to guard him because we felt like we saw them in the playoffs every other year. And we always try to do stuff, trap him, uh, sometimes play him one-on-one, -on -one, try to mix it up on him. But uh, he's had some uh, incredible games and, of course, an incredible career. And uh, probably, arguably, the, the best power forward ever. Have you got any KG stories? Because uh, the players' KG stories, it feels like this man would be going absolutely nuts if the water isn't boiling quick enough for his coffee in the morning. He, uh, he is one of a kind, but <laughs> his, 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 his intensity is what made him so great, right? I mean, his competitiveness. I remember uh, we had a game where it was going back and forth, and I got, we had a timeout, and I get about a huddle, 
and he had left his time out huddle early and he was already waiting outside of our huddle. So as soon as I got up, he's basically <laughs> yeah. standing right here and he's walking nose to nose, breathing in my ear the entire time as I walked to my spot. So it's just, that's who KG was. He, he tried to intimidate you. He tried to compete at the highest level. And uh, he was definitely a one of a kind, but he also, you know, brought out the best in you because he, he made you uh, compete and he, he he wanted to kick your butt. Uh, the grind of not getting over the hump in the postseason and then coming back and it was 10 years for you. What do you recall about having to go home and say, okay, now we've got 82 games again. I got to have all these flights, all this travel and try and get there again. I mean, the, 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 I think the first year the grind was the hardest to, to understand the flights and, you know, the playing and the traveling. Uh, but once you get used to it, it's just, it's, it's, it's okay, you know. The frustration level after the playoffs is obviously high. Then you're like, you take a three couple, couple weeks off, clear your mind. Then you're back at the in the gym. You work, how can I get better? How can I take my game to the next level? Uh, and, and then you work hard and you get better and, uh, and you play international ball every summer for me. And then I went back in the season looking forward to uh, a new season, new, motivated again, uh, to hopefully win the championship, new goals. And uh, so I've, I've, been, I've always enjoyed the grind. You know, there's, you know, I loved working out. I loved working hard in the summer, getting better. And then I loved the beginning of the season when the season's coming and so uh, yeah, I just I just love the grind and I love to work hard and uh, and become a better player. So Luke is probably the MVP favorite. Obviously, there's a few candidates there. You played with guys like Jason Kidd and Steve Nash, and those types of pure point guards feels like aren't as common these days. How do you view the super high usage guys like Luca and playing at an extremely high level and James Harden? You mentioned earlier and the way that it's kind of changed in that regard. Yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of pass pass first guards anymore. <clears throat> Feels like it's a little bit old school. Uh, nowadays, you have to score, 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 and then that sets up the passing. I um, mean, Jake Kidd and, and Steve, you almost had to force these guys to shoot. They were sometimes overpassing or uh, passing up good shots where you had to go there and say, hey, no, no, we need you to shoot those and we need to keep the defense honest. So uh, it's, it's a different game now. It's another thing that has evolved. And, now the scoring almost sets up your your assists. Uh, it was it was different, um, uh, obviously with with the other guards. But you know that's just the way it is now. Uh, the, the, you have to play nowadays a strong one on one game. You gotta have to step back three in your game as a guard. You gotta have to drive both ways, uh, and that sets up obviously your assists. But uh, yeah, the, the game is just uh, is different these days. And how does that impact? You know, three and day, three and D felt like it used to be a specialized role, and now everyone has to do that. How does that impact a guy like Josh Green? And I think it helps him. Uh, he's a great defender already. He's athletic. He plays super super hard, and 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 now he added the three point or more to his game. Obviously, that's uh, that's that's one thing that he needed to get better at, and he's put in a lot of work. Uh, so we're happy for him. We're happy for him that. Uh, he's gotten better and he's worked extremely hard and, uh, and and now he's a really, really good player for us. Unfortunately, he's been out for a few weeks now uh, with injury, but um, I'm looking forward to him uh, having, having a strong comeback and and showing uh, what he's what he's got and, uh, and and being a big time player for us. Last one I've got for you and you read all the stories, you hear your former teammates and they always say how funny you are first and then talk about your singing. So. Are you a better singer or comedian? And how much do you pride yourself on your on your, on your voice, on your vocals? I'm not a singer at all. <laughs> I'm not a singer at all. Uh, I enjoy, I love music, uh, but I'm not, a, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not a singer. But, you know, my personality was always to have fun. Uh, yeah. Fun first. Uh, one of these guys, my team is to be comfortable uh, around me and, uh, you know, just joking around a lot. There was not a lot of times where I was actually serious outside of the game. Um, so I, I wanted these guys to, uh, to to laugh, to have no pressure, to enjoy the moment and uh, and just be comfortable. And so I was always, we made fun of each other's outfits every day, the shoes whenever somebody came in. It, just, <laughs> it was just part of being a locker room. And I do miss that. I do miss being around the guys and and joking around and, and laughing every day and making fun of guys. And so uh, I, I do miss the banter a little bit, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the game. 
You've got about a thousand signatures to do, mate. So I'll let you go. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks for having me.